Good evening, everyone, and thank you for attending this presentation. I'm really excited to introduce um, a book I got a little sneak peek at a few months ago um, by Dr. Dan Gifford. Dr. Gifford is a public historian who focuses on American popular and visual culture, as well as museums and American culture. He received his PhD from George Mason University in 2011. Daniel Gifford's career spans both academia and public history, including several years with the Smithsonian Institution. Universities near his home in Louisville, Kentucky. And I'm very pleased uh, to introduce Dr. Gifford to give us uh, the presentation, his first presentation <laughs> on his newly published book. So Dan, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right, well, thank you. And thank you everyone for, for coming. Um, it's always exciting to, to see um, a book come out and and then to have the response of and the interest. So this is really exciting that for that first venue is the New Bedford Whaling Museum. Um, and I have to just say, you know, right from the beginning, thank you so much. One at the uh, museum. Uh, this book would not have been possible without uh, their assistance, um, including a, a, a residency, a scholar in residency. Um, that I had the opportunity to do um, in the research phase of the book. So uh, huge thank you to everyone um, there in New Bedford. Um, what I thought I'd do to, to sort of kick things off is actually read um, a couple pages from the book. Um, actually, the, the beginning of the book, uh, the beginning of chapter one, um, and while I'm reading, put up a couple images that sort of go with that and give you um, a sense of, of Sort of what the book is about and and sort of the big picture questions um, raised by the book sort of the things that I wanted to have. we can talk um, again into more detail and more uh, of the nuance of the book so I'm going to go I'm going to do that share screen thing um, gotta find all the right buttons and you should see see that go all right, so hopefully you see the cover of the book, and I'm just going to, as I said, read a little bit from these first few pages. So we start with New Bedford, June 8th, 1892. It seemed as if the entire harbor had spontaneously erupted into a palette of red, white, and blue. The colors gleam of southeastern breeze at the steamers and bunting that was generously affixed to nearly any object edifice the decorators could find. The summer gusts also played with countless hats, jackets, dresses, and ribbons among the tightly packed crowds who had congregated along the wharfs by mid-morning. A few stalwart boys sat at water's edge, minding their fishing poles rather than the estimated 3,000 onlookers back behind them. But they too could not keep their eyes off the gleaming hulk of red and white that sat just off to the right. The whaling bark progress had been festooned with hunting, bunting and streamers were snapped in the wind from the mastheads and yard arms. A large signal flag waving from the masthead declared in bright tall letters the name of the bark, although she needed no introduction for those who had gathered. The crack of American flags echoed off the facade of the New Bedford Court clay and weight. Her hull had been painted a bright brick red. Her divots holding the six-man whaleboats gleamed white, as did the deck house. James E. Reed, the prominent African-American photographer who had co-founded Hadley and Reed on Purchase Street, ensured that the proceedings were photographed to his exacting specifications and with his famous eye for detail. As the progress was towed away from Roach's wharf, a crowd erupted in a deafening cheer, which gave way to song. After a turn of life on the ocean waves, Hill's brass band led the New Bedford throngs through the melancholy words of the girl I left behind me. So be decked in the decorative finery of signal flags and bright colors added to the concocting. Bells and whistles accompanied the multitude, multitude's rendition of the well-known tune. Ye gods above, oh hear my prayer to my beauteous fair to find me and send me safely back again to the girl I left behind me. Ladies pulled out handkerchiefs to wave as the bark was pulled towards Buzzer's Bay. By that blustery day in June 1892, New Bedford had been launching whaling ships to every part of the globe for a century. 
Thousands of voyages have begun from the same wharfs that the Progress now passed on her way to the Bay, Central Wharf, Haber, Atlantic. Tens of thousands of men had unmoored from New Bedford docks, knowing the passage of time that marked distance from loved ones would typically be measured in years, not weeks or months. An incalculable number of people in New Bedford had watched whalers disappear onto the horizon, wondering if they would ever return. And yet, no single departure of a whaling ship had ever generated the sort of holiday atmosphere that surrounded the departure of this particular whaling ship. This departure was different. It was special. And it carried with it the legacies, dreams, and memories of an entire community. The progress was not going to sea to hunt for whales, as so many whale ships had done before. She was going to Chicago to be displayed like a crown jewel for all the world to see. She was going to the World's Columbian Exposition of 1893, and New Bedfordists were sure that she would be one of the most popular attractions at the World's Fair that promised to be the event of the decade, perhaps even the century. She would tell American visitors from Maine to Chicago a story of New Bedford's whaling heritage and history, and she would remind the world how New Bedford had once lit the globe and lubricated the Industrial Revolution with whale oil. The cheers and huzzas and whistles gave voice to a civic pride that brought many New Bedfordiers to tears that day. The progress would mark their place in history. Chicago, April 14th, 1900. Spring was slowly working its way into Chicago's frigid bones. The day had been mild and pleasant, and that night a full moon rose and shone down from the clear skies. The sky ground century waters of the northwest shore of Lake Michigan. It was quiet save for the calls and beating wings of various ducks, gulls, and herons. They would occasionally alight on the now unrecognizable husk of the progress. She rested on her side in the mud of the harbor of the Calumet, a stench-filled point where the mouth of the Calumet River vainly tried to dis discharge an accumulation of industrial waste and sewage into Lake Michigan. But the current of the river was not strong enough, and inky pools of oil, livestock blood, and muck collected and shimmered in the moonlight. While steel mills, chemical plants, and packing houses upriver belched and buzzed as busy hives of modern labor, the atmosphere here was decidedly more graveyard-esque. Surrounding the progress were the moorbound bodies of other vessels in varying states of decay and despair. Here was the derelict schooner Mary E. Dykes, damaged in a storm and now poking out of the fetid waters. Over there, just a few feet from the progress, was the John E. Dix, a Civil War cutter that was falling apart bit by bit. The motley collection had long ago been picked over for anything of worth, but the progress especially had been a boon for scavengers over the years. The copper from her hull had disappeared early on. Most of the usable wood went next, taken by men and women who lived on the margins and needed the easily burnable kindling to stay warm. The remaining shell was rank and rotting, an inconvenient part of an inconvenient assemblage that made navigating the Calumet difficult for modern ships. This is where the progress of story ended, on her side in the foul, frigid waters around Chicago. It would be nearly two years longer before fire and dynamite would finally finish the job and the few scraps of the remaining wood leaving red paint would settle into the muddy bottom. Only the demolition team and flocks of startled birds would bear witness to this ignominious finale. So with that, I'll come back. And um, so that's, that's how the book begins. And, and the reason I, I set it up that way is I was really struck by what was obviously a failure. Um, this this sense of a, a story, had, and and I I wanted to know what went wrong. Uh, how could something that had people so um, so excited um, at the beginning turn into something um, that was so far from from what had been anticipated and hoped for? Um, and from that, um, this book came about, um, sort of addressing that question, looking at that question, and, and trying to figure out what we could draw um, as lessons from, from this particular story.
Uh, so Akia, that's sort of my intro. I don't uh, if do we maybe want to dive in a little deeper. Um, so before I open it up to questions at the end, um, there are just a few things that I wanted to talk to Dan about having read the book. And I have to say it's my favorite type of historical narrative because it's a story about the Bark progress, but it's really not. It's a story about <laughs> a lot of different things. So it's a story about a dying industry. It's a story about how we now view that dying industry and the manipulation of the story of whaling over time. It's a story about immigration and the textile industry. Um, and so, you know, because of because of that complexity, and, and you so you even of the bark progress, um, it's just an, an amazing story. But the thing that I love most about it is that the the intro to the story is about your own family connection to the bark progress. Yeah. Um, so I was hoping you could talk about that a little bit because I think um, particularly for a Bedford uh, audience, because so many of us either uh, have ancestors that came to New Bedford and we now live in New Bedford, or we have ancestors that came through New Bedford and history is kept alive for us because we want to, we want to tell those stories. Um, those origin stories. So can you talk a little bit about your relationship to this this historical um, event? Story? Yeah, so and it's actually it's 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 something that historians I think really um, enjoy uh, this this piece because it's not that common that as historians we get to write about something that that has a, a connection to our own uh, ancestors. So I'm going to go back to that um, uh, sharing screen and just show one more picture. Uh, and the the gentleman you see here is my great great grandfather, um, also named Daniel Gifford. Uh, ours is not uh, a particularly uh, innovative family when it comes to family names, uh, but this was Captain Gifford. Um, and in fact, uh, growing up, um, I I was not only aware of of him as an ancestor, but was also aware of his rather colorful nickname um, that I was able to verify, I found a primary source that, that verified this, Bloody Dan. Uh, Captain Bloody Dan Gifford was how he was known. Um, and it was many years ago, it was actually 1998, that I was doing some genealogy that I think you know a lot of people do. Uh, like I said, I kind of was aware of this. So, a little bit more about him and found an obituary, a New Bedford obituary, um, and just one line in there said, uh, and Captain Gifford took the whaling bark progress to Chicago for the Chicago World's Fair. Um, now this was back before I had, you know, ever got, gone to grad school, ever taken uh, history classes, um, but that just stuck with me. I mean, obviously my first reaction was how, how the heck do you get a whaling ship to Chicago? Um, and and from that, I just had this really um, nugget stuck in my head. Uh, so when I went through graduate school, um, when I started teaching, um, I found myself returning to the World's Fair, returning to the Columbian Exposition over and over again. And that gave me opportunities to, to dive a little deeper um, into this story. And so it, it, it turns out that Captain Gifford uh, was the captain uh, in charge of this vessel. Um, it, as it was towed uh, through uh, various canals and rivers and ultimately the Great Lakes system um, to Chicago. Um, and um, that I was able to uh, really sort of draw uh, on not just his story and the story of the progress, but some of these larger themes um, that were going on in the span of his lifetime. He was born in 1839. He went on his first voyage at the age of 16, and he died in 1899. So if you know a little bit about the history of whaling, you know, that life sort of is the perfect, you know, rise and fall, you know, sort of his youth is the golden age of whaling, and by his death, is, it's really the, the end of whaling. And he heard that from beginning to end. So, so I had this sort of sense of metaphor about his life that then gets laid on to the metaphors about the progress, about this, this whaling ship uh, that goes to Chicago to, to represent whaling and, and what happens. So it, it really was kind of a, 
um, a neat opportunity that I know a lot of historians don't don't get to do. And you know, I had to be careful. I had to you know think about objectivity and um, you know sort of keep my keep my distance. And the end, it very much drew me closer to um, this New Bedford relative and sort of the world that he lived in, the New Bedford he lived in. Um, he was the last generation. His his son is the one that then, you know, left New Bedford and, and the family has not been, you know, part of the New Bedford community since. So this was really not just a reach back as a historian, but a reach back as a Gifford um, into a family that had had since moved on from, from you know, this really interesting community. So uh, when you talk about uh, the other Dan Gifford's lifespan, <laughs> sort of representing the span of, of sort of the height and decline of whaling, um, the, the narratives during that period about whaling, um, and so there's one quote that I do want to read from the book that really struck me. Um, it's, our attractive and romantic past was not only forgotten, it was actually repudiated. We were on with the new love. We were an irritated to be reminded of our long continued amours with the old. The Board of Trade actually became incensed because someone alluded to New Bedford, the newborn queen of fine textiles as an old whaling town. Um, and so can you talk a little bit about this? Uh, the sort of mighty whaleman on a pedestal and nostalgia about whaling to discomfort or even a sense of disgust. You know, it, it, it became about filthy, dirty whalemen mm -hmm. um, as opposed to people who brought income and life to the city. Yeah, uh, this was actually one of my, I guess I shouldn't say I have favorites, you know, but it's like, you know, choosing from your kids, you know, this is actually one of my favorite chapters, the, the chapter that has this quote. Um, because I'd read a lot of histories about this, this transformation of New Bedford from being a whaling city and the products of the whaling industry sort of as the lifeblood um, of New Bedford and that shift to cotton <clears throat> and cotton manufacturing. Um, and of course, you know, what's so fascinating about that is that many of the families that had made their fortune in whaling pivot. Um, and move that money over into uh, the cotton mills. And, and many of the names that were family names that were associated with whaling for generations now become associated with this whole other industry. Um, that's all pretty well documented. I mean, that was not new research for me, but, but what struck me reading a lot of those accounts was they seemed to be very distant. They seemed to be very value neutral. Um, you know, it was sort of like, you know, well, whaling wasn't profitable anymore, cotton was, so of course people, you know, put their money where they could, you know, make a good investment. And it was very sort of, you know, just, oh, but that's the logical, you know, capitalist gilded age narrative. And, and maybe it was because, you know, I was thinking of this from the viewpoint of my ancestor who is still in whaling, who is still part of this, you know, decreasing community, but, but is still doing it. Um, and I just wondered if it was really that sort of blase, that sort of, you know, oh, this just sort of happens. Um, and, and what I found, and I think that quote, you know, speaks to it is, no, it wasn't just, you know, oh, we did this and now we do that. But there was a lot of resentment, but there was a lot of, of anger by this, this whaling community, however much smaller it was, that the move to cotton, the shift to cotton manufacturing, the shift to these cotton mills, you know, was hate not only changing the character of New Bedford, bringing in immigrants, you know, changing the dynamics of the city, but was also maybe hastening whaling's decline. And I've never found anybody that said, you know, it's one for one or, you know, cotton killed whaling. But I did find a lot of uh, people at the time that said, you know, whaling's demise was hastened by this, that whaling could have continued longer, that maybe, you know, things could have uh, a, a decade or another generation had it not been for this. Um, and there was a lot of, of talk about, you know, cotton um, in sort of disparaging terms. That's that sort of, you know, as, as your quote uh, suggests, you know, that, you know, oh, you know, 
this is the high and mighty industry, not uh, the low industry that no one wants to talk about anymore. Um, you know, th and that sort of um, biting tongue, I think, was indicative of, of something that I, I suspected was there and, um, you know, hopefully bring out, bring out a little bit more. In and that's so relevant to the progress story is this, this question of, of commemoration, this question of a whaling museum, a whaling memorial, um, you know, capturing the whaling industry. Um, who was interested in that? Who, who was attempting that? And who was sort of the stakeholders who still had um, skin in the game, as we would say today? And I just want to let everyone know, um, Dan, you're getting a lot of questions. Um, I want to let everyone know we will get to them. Some of them, um, I'm going to hold up, they require us backtracking a bit. Um, and others, I think that we'll get to just in the course of our conversation. But I just want to assure everyone I am seeing your questions in chat. Um, one of the things that, that uh, I thought we could talk about is that um, ultimately, you know, the story of the Bark Progress is one of, um, well, one of the things it's about is a, a dying industry and are either nostalgia or neglect of dying industries. So whaling is the perfect example of one. Um, but, you know, we can talk about the steel industry. We can talk about, you know, the little mom and pop candy stores or corner she used to sort of define American industry. Um, and so the, the fate of the bark progress sort of uh, mirrors how we've traditionally handled dying industries. So I don't, uh, I wonder if you want to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so, um, you know, I don't want to give too much away in the book, you know, I don't, don't want there to be too many spoilers, but, you know, at the beginning, I, I, I made it very clear that, you know, this, this was a failure, um, that this idea of a whaling ship failed. And, and there's a lot of things that go into that. There isn't just one, one piece of that, and there isn't just one reason. Um, there's, there's a lot of different reasons, but one of them is this idea of, uh, of it was being told, and who was sort of in charge of that. Um, and what happens with the progress is because it went to Chicago, because it was, um, you know, ultimately displayed in Chicago, and it was actually displayed in Chicago before the fair, um, actually on the, the Chicago River at the State Street Bridge, if you can imagine a whale ship there, um, before it then moved to the fairgrounds. Um, you know, this was not Chicago's story. Um, and by the time it makes it to... Uh, uh, fairgrounds, um, even the crew, uh, the New Bedford crew, had been dismissed, uh, which came as a big surprise to them. They, they thought they were going to be there for the fair. Um, and so, you know, ultimately it becomes Chicago men and really a Chicago coal baron uh, that becomes in charge of this museum. Um, and so one of the factors, one of the things sort of at play in here um, is this question of, you know, who who ultimately was telling whatever story the museum was going to tell. You know, when you go into a museum, that's been thought through by people um, that, you know, have sort of um, a viewpoint that they want to share and do that through, through the exhibits. Um, that didn't happen with the progress in part because, um, you know, once the ship left New Bedford that day um, that I described um, in 1892, um, that was, that link was severed, um, that, that sort of connective tissue between the two, um, was severed. And so, um, you know, as we look at modern museums to say coal or steel, or even, you know, the Whaley Museum in New Bedford, I think one of the, that goes is the physicality of those museums. The fact that they are in the community, the fact that they are connected to people, that either are still, you know, in those industries or their families and descendants. Um, and, and that sort of connection to community, connection to these trades and trades, men and women, the laborers of the industry is still there. Um, and so going back to, you know, my original question, you know, here you have this, this excitement on this day in New Bedford and this terrible end uh, in Chicago, you know, and what's, what's in between those two, why, what 
when you know that's that's part of what comes out in the book is is the sort of loss of community loss of connection um and it's and what's really interesting um again not to give too much away but it's actually it's actually something that sort of unfolds um in stages the further from uh new bedford you go so uh over the i've seen a couple of questions about the route um so yes it goes up the saint lawrence river um to montreal then through the canal system around the Welland Canal, uh, around Niagara Falls, um, and then through the, the Great Lakes uh, for the rest of the way. Uh, but it makes stops all along the way. Um, to make stops in Montreal, uh, it makes stops in Buffalo. Uh, it does make a stop in Detroit, but by then uh, Captain Gifford is so sick of uh, tourists and visitors, he doesn't let anyone on board. Um, so it's there in Detroit, but no one can, can get on board. Um, and then it continues on to Racine and Milwaukee for kind of its final outfitting uh, before its grand debut um, in Chicago. And then, as I said, it's actually displayed uh, in two places in Chicago, one downtown and then one ultimately at the fairground. And what's so interesting uh, in telling that story, and I sort of tell it chronologically, is um, each stop sort of pushes it further and further away from that original idea that that was very clear to New Bedford, you know, that you would have a whaling museum, the, the whaling industry and the whaling practice and, you know, the mechanics of whaling and, 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 you know, that was sort of their obvious way of doing it. And, and by the time it gets to Chicago, it's, it's something else. It's yeah, I had mentioned this to you in an email. The story um, and, and people who are listening now from New Bedford will, will be able to relate to this. The story of the Bark Progress is so similar to the story of our, our panorama, which we put on display. Uh, um, it, it was an amazing success here. It's this, you know, 1300 foot painting that was put on display in New Bedford and throughout the region and people paid their quarter to see it. They were willing to pay that to see this, this voyage that literally captured the world um, from a firsthand perspective. And as it traveled west, you know, when it got to the Midwest, nobody cared. <laughs> it was, it was a, you know, it was a failure. And I think for, for many of the same reasons you just discussed, it was, you know, people were further removed from that story, the further out it went, the farther out it went. You know, and I think the fact that it was in Chicago definitely, you know, has a bearing on the story a little bit, too, because Chicago, by the, the time of the fair, by the 1890s, you know, was so focused on, uh, ironically, progress, <laughs> on modernity, on, you know, of, of the coming century. Um, and so this sort of, you know, slow, lumbering, whale ship that supposed you know harkens to the past i think just you know it was so out of step with where chicago especially was in the 1890s um and a lot of the messages from the columbian exposition you know of uh, uh you know sort of turning the page on the next century uh, um as opposed to this this relic sort of that that invites you to look backwards and and within mystery and, and, you know, again, very much parallels, I think, to today. I think there's a lot of industries we could point to that, that are sort of going through those same questions, those same, you know, understandings about, you know, not only their place in the past, but their place today. Absolutely. Um, there was one other thing I, I really enjoyed about the book. And again, it's because I think you really... Um, you were able to capture the complexity of this seemingly simple issue. You know, they brought this bark out uh, to Chicago and it failed. And, and you weave a lot of different in, in, into that failure. Um, and you have a chapter that begins with the story of a woman named Kate, uh, who was an Irish immigrant. And, and what you touch upon in that chapter is not only did the decline of the whaling industry and the rise of the textile industry profoundly impact the economy of New Bedford, but uh, it, it varied based on your race, your ethnicity, your gender, your social class. So um, I was hoping you could elaborate on that reality a little bit. 
Yeah, definitely. And and I think, you know, this this kind of goes back into some of these questions of um you know, and who should care about it? I think, you know, reading a lot about uh, the immigrants that were coming in and these immigrant families, and I picked this one family in particular um, that, you know, were, were mill workers, um, you know, they're Irish immigrants. Um, and what did they care about whaling? You know, this was not their heritage. This was not their history. Um, and, and reading accounts of the time, you know, there were a lot of people in New Bedford that were writing in a very concerned way about the fact that, you know, the geography of New Bedford was that, um, that it wasn't focused on the wharfs anymore. It wasn't focused on, on ships headed for, for the sea. It was focused on these, these factories and these mills. Uh, it was it physically changing, but it was psychologically changing. That, um, you know, the new happening places were, you know, these immigrant dance halls and meeting halls and, uh, you know, lively streets and, you know, the sort of, you know, core downtown uh, was, you know, again, this sort of dichotomy between the old, old New Bedford and the, and the new, um, and wasn't it better to leave the old behind? Um, and one, one thing that I, I found really interesting is, you know, the sort of attempts by all our whaling community to try to make inroads with this immigrant uh, community to try to you know change their mind or get them interested um, you know in sort of the old patrician um, aspects of, of New Bedford and so the Howlands Matthew and, and Rachel Howland um, uh, actually create a, a chapel a non-denominational chapel that was meant for the immigrant communities um, and I talk about how they would have walked right past that on their way to the Irish church. And within, you know, about three years, uh, Rachel was already writing, uh, trying to figure out how much money she could get if, if they went ahead and liquidated that, how much money they could get back uh, out of that bad investment. Uh, because it was changing in these new immigrant groups, Irish, uh, French Canadian, um, and, and, you know, others, um, you know, had no, had no personal connection to whaling and therefore didn't see the value of it, didn't see the value of perpetuating it um, beyond, you know, those few ships that go out each year, you know, in smaller and smaller numbers. Yeah, there was no fascination with the sea. You know, as previous yeah. immigrant groups who came in um, on whaling ships already had maritime cultures and you know, the Polish that were coming in, as you said, the French Canadians, um, the, the British, the Irish, there, there just wasn't that same sort of maritime uh, industry that they, that they were coming. Well, just so we don't run out of time, I want to get to some of these questions that people are sending you. Yeah, there's some great um, so ones. So we'll shift actually. gears a little bit. Um, the first one, and excuse me for looking over, I'm reading the, the <laughs> chat screen. The first one is from Bonnie Lilienfeld, who um, said it's great to see you and that she <laughs> loves the beginning of the book. Uh, what a powerful story. I can't wait to read it. I know this isn't central to your book, but I was so interested to hear about the African-American photographer taking the picture. You talk at all about him in the book. Was there a large African-American community in New Bedford at this time? Um, so, um, I don't talk a ton about him, um, in the book, you know, his sort of role was to capture this one moment, um, and then, you know, the, the ship was gone, uh, from New Bedford, so he doesn't really, I don't get a chance to weave him back into the story, but it, I found it really interesting that there was this really prominent African-American photographer, and that he would have been hired by this Chicago coal baron, either directly or, or someone told him, you know, oh yeah, you, you should really hire this guy. He's the best in town. Um, because he was the one that actually produced the photos in, in a souvenir that was written uh, to, to exit through the gift shop <laughs> and, and buy this book um, that was actually a children's book. Um, so I just, I found, I found that to be really interesting that this, this African-American photographer 
you know, got the commission, got the job, you know, and probably did because he was recommended as the best in town. You know, Henry Weaver was very much a, um, if you remember the, the character from Jurassic Park who always said, you know, no expense was spared, that was spared. That was sort of Henry Weaver's uh, philosophy, at least at the beginning, um, you know, was to, you know, sort of throw money at things. And so, you know, this photographer among them. So, yes, New Bedford actually did have um, a vi very vibrant African-American community, um, many of which were brought in um, and participated through the generations by whaling. Um, and, you know, whaling is sort of, and I think, Aki, I think you might be able to talk a little bit more about this, but, you know, has been seen as very much a meritocracy that was largely colorblind, um, or at least that was, you know, a lot of the rhetoric. Um, and at, sort of layered onto that um, because New Bedford was also going to talk about in my first chapter, um, it also had a strong abolitionist uh, movement, abolitionist streak. And so the, the combination of those two, um, you know, created an African-American community that, that, you know, is talked about contemporarily um, more in, in positive terms than, than other communities at the same, same time. Um, I wouldn't go so far as to say that there were unique opportunities in New Bedford for African Americans, but people noted that New Bedford seemed different. Seems, you know, had a different sort of race relationship than a lot of other towns, um, you know, in, in the 19th century. Yeah, I would definitely, definitely agree. It was far from perfect, right, because we hear mm -hmm. these stories mm -hmm. of um, though Frederick Douglass came here and stayed here because it was the seat of a lot of abolitionist activity and a very important stop on the Underground Railroad, when he first got here, he could not get a job as a caulker, um, which he was trained to do. And the thinking behind it is the white caulkers on the wharf will black man this, this position. So he wasn't able to do that. But, um, you know, I think the difference between New Bedford and some other places was the idea that you could hop on a ship and go around the world. So if you were a runaway enslaved person, you could hop on a ship and, and have an income and go around the world. Um, or you knew it was safe here and there were places that would house you. You knew that there was a maritime industry. So even for free African-American men, it was not only probably the only integrated in this you said it was a meritocracy um it, and again it wasn't perfect uh right. but it was mm -hmm. a secure income and so if you look at this time period one of the only stable jobs you could get as as an african-american man was in maritime industries um and so new bedford was popular uh amongst African Americans for, for many of those reasons and more. Um, and I just want to sort of put out there that we have uh, several of James Reed's photos in the Whaling Museum, uh, including one, I think, including um, he was very popular and, and very sought after. Great. Awesome. Um, so the next question is from Sarah Cunningham. Um, who says, um, and I don't remember, sorry, Sarah, at what point you made this comment, but she said, so laced with irony. Oh, here's, here's why. So laced with irony to name the ship Progress and keep that name, even as by 1893, the ship displayed as part of the anthropology exhibit in the context of racialized curiosities. So that, that was fairs as well. Wondering who paid for all of this. What did they hope for? How did New Bedford react to the failure of the exhibit? <laughs> uh, so many great questions in there. Um, so, um, so I mentioned um, already that the, the person who paid for it was actually uh, a Chicago syndicate, sort of led by, by this uh, gentleman named Henry Weaver, um, who was a coal baron. But his family was sort of am lots of amateur historians within his family. Um, his side. So, you know, it, I never found like the smoking gun that that directly connected how this coal baron, you know, found the progress. But, you know, um, 
it was you know through networking in Chicago, there's probably a prospectus. There's a single club in Chicago, a gentleman's club called the Union League Club um, that Henry Weaver was part of. It definitely would have gone through that. Um, and so, you know, it becomes a Chicago property. It becomes a Chicago exhibit. And, and when it arrives in Chicago, um, it's sort of big debut. A lot of that, you know, this is now Chicago's prize. This is now Chicago's um, to, to display. Um, and, and yeah, you're absolutely right that, you know, uh, in that time, you, you have a lot of racialized context and racialized curiosities. Uh, one, of, one of just the absolute worst things about what the progress became um, was, I think I mentioned that the, the crew had been dismissed back in Racine, the New Bedford crew, uh, who were actually whalers, who actually had the experience. Um, and most of the people you saw on, on board were actually, uh, uh, you know, young guys from the, the fresh, uh, freshwater schooners. But there was one uh, crewman who stayed on at least for a time uh, by the name of Jimmy Kanaka. Um, and Kanaka was sort of a catch-all last name for someone from, you know, the South, South Indies, South Seas. Um, and he apparently had he tattoos from head to toe. And so suddenly, um, all the press accounts and actually the brochure for the, the um, ship when you came on board, when you came on the museum, uh, said that you were going to be king a king of Fiji, the first such royal to ever visit Chicago. Uh, so that gives you a little sense of what, what, this pro what the progress became, what the story of uh, the progress came, and how far that was from, you know, sort of this didactic, very educational, very literal display of, of where, the mechanics of whaling and how whaling, you know, worked and operated. Um, and so, you know, the big part of the book is sort of dedicated to that disconnect. You're absolutely right that that disconnect is very much rooted in, you know, anthropology, uh, racial, you know, assumptions, um, and, and, you know, um, you know, less and less about museum craft and about the whaling industry and more about, you know, spectacle and, and, you know, what's gonna, uh, what's gonna have the sizzle, what's gonna have the razzle. Um, oh, and your, your last question, how did the Bedfords react? Um, this was actually, I think, a really important point um, that I wanted to emphasize in the book, uh, and that is that New Bedford remained aware of, of all of this, thanks to syndications, syndicated stories. Um, pretty much every time there was a story in Chicago about the uh, demise, and, and the demise was long. It was a long decline um, that got towed around a bunch of different places. Um, all of that kept filtering back to New Bedford. And all these stories kept filtering back to New Bedford. Um, and so even though there was sort of the severed link where the ship sailed and it became something else entirely, people of New Bedford remained aware of it and remained aware of how this was kind of a black eye, um, how this was you know, being seen in the press, being talked about in the press, um, sort of a, you know, wow, this is, this is a real shame, isn't this, you know, this sad industry. Um, and so that final act of blowing up what um, happened um, in, I forget my, my date here, um, January, uh, or excuse me, um, back in April of 1902, in January of 1903, so less than a year, um, was that famous meeting in New Bedford where people came together and said, we need to have a whaling museum. Um, and what was so interesting about reading the accounts, and I read every account I could get my hands on just to make sure I wasn't missing something. Um, there were speeches, there were follow-ups, there were brochures. The progress was never mentioned um, in all of that. You know, this, this whole idea of we did a whaling, um, you know, this whaling ship full of things from New Bedford, um, and it failed never came up. But that meeting was just a few months after New Bedford would have read about the progress finally being dynamited and finally sinking into these muddy waters, you know, in Chicago. And I, and I, I can't believe that that's just a coincidence. I can't believe 
that, you know, the sort of narrative been dragging on for years. And then just a few months after it finally, you know, is put to rest, it finally, the zombie is finally dead, um, that New Bedford begins planning its own whaling museum. Um, I just, that's too much of a coincidence for me. To look at that happenstance. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. I'm going to start skipping around um, some of the questions a bit just to make sure we're uh, maybe touching upon things that we didn't in our own conversation. Mm -hmm. And what I will do, just so everyone knows, I'll save the chat and um, we'll forward the questions to Dan, certainly. But um, feel free, you know, anyone to get in touch with me at the museum. Um, Dan, I don't know if you want to give your, your website for those who might read the book or if it's on the page for the me and I'll um, you know be a go-between for some of these questions that we might not be able to get to. Um, one from Nancy Gentile uh, is does your family have any memorabilia from his personal papers or other items? Have you been able to speak to your parents or grandparents about him? What might they have remembered? Um, so we do have um, a few objects that that came down uh, sort of through through the the ancestry. Um, unfortunately, none, um, nothing along the lines of papers or diaries or journals or scrapbooks or anything like that. Um, it was more you know physical objects, uh, things that came off ships um, back in the day. I guess I mean the, the one thing I will say that um, I'm very pleased about is, you know, Bloody Dan, Captain Gifford, Captain Daniel Gifford, you know, was part of family lore from, you know, when I was this high. Um, you know, everybody in the family knew this piece of history, which I think is, is really cool. You know, we all knew um, that we came from whalers, that we had this whaling connection. Um, and that didn't disappear. You know, it was uh, Captain Gifford's son that moved to the Midwest. Uh, my family's still, you know, in the St. Louis area. So, you know, that easily could have been forgotten. Wasn't. Um, but, um, you know, just because of the generations, he was my great-great-grandfather, so it was, you know, definitely um, a lot of generations. You know, the sort of folklore and any sort of, you know, uh, paper uh, trail um, had long gone. Um, that just wasn't available, and uh, you know, grandparents and great grandparents, and unfortunately, weren't weren't there to ask anymore. So it really was um, recreating um, his life from scratch uh, in that sense, um, really sort of. And but the good news is, and and okay, you can speak to this, uh, is you know, the great thing about whalers is they leave a ton of documents. Um, there's log books. Um, there. There's from ages. There's things that are scattered around um, in archives from all the different places where the courts have called. Um, so, you know, in that sense, I'm very lucky to have a whaler ancestor because there was a, a good paper trail uh, to follow. And of course, you know, this piece of the story that you know, was national news. I mean, it, it did capture the image. It failed, but it did capture the imagination. Um, and so there was a lot of press coverage and there was a lot of uh, newspaper accounts both in New Bedford and in Chicago um, that as well as all the the stops along the way where uh, we could visit libraries and archives and and do that research and, and sort of reconstruct everything um, you know from the actual journey. Yes yeah, so I can definitely speak to that um, you're very lucky if you've had a whaler in the family I've found <laughs> my own you know at the whaling museum with things I didn't know existed. So it's, it's a, they were, it was a well-documented industry. Catherine Hunter asks if Olmsted designed a pier to tie the ship in Chicago. So, um, so as I mentioned, the, the progress had sort of two, two stops. First was at the State Street Bridge in downtown Chicago. And that was entirely separate from the World's Fair. That was Henry Weaver. Um, he had a lot of political connections. That was him pulling strings um, to get the whale ship right at the, the heart of Chicago. Um, I'm not going to give a spoiler, but I will say when you get to that part of the book, 
there's there's some really fun stuff there. Um, and then it has to go to the fairgrounds, and and the fairgrounds are really interesting. You know, uh, Olmsted, of course, you know, has designed the fairgrounds. What's so interesting about the progress is all of the bridges that Olmsted had in his plan had to be built after the progress went in. So the progress is actually towed to the fairgrounds long before the fair opens, uh, because they have to get it in the pond, the, the south pond. Um, and actually, this is a good opportunity. Yeah, my uh, PowerPoint slides back up and show you where it was. So, so this is a, a map of the of the Columbian Exposition, the Chicago World's Fair, and right over here is the progress, way over here. So it actually had to be towed to that spot, and then everything was built around it. You know, these these bridges you can see the sort of uh, hold uh, are, are basically um, all were built after the, the progress was was towed into place, um, and. I guess as so long as we're here, I can show a couple pictures. This is uh, this is what you would have seen. This was actually a really exciting find of uh, a snapshot, a really rare snapshot uh, that was taken um, of the entrance. Um, and so you can see um, this, this would have been the ticket booth. Um, and, and as you can see, you know, Arctic Whaling Museum, 10,000 marine curiosities between decks. See this uh, museum is sort of turned into. Um, again, you know, someone mentioned how, how close this was to some of the anthropology exhibits, um, the, the sort of Native American displays um, that were, were there. Um, here's another view. Um, so, so to answer your question, um, you know, Olmsted designed everything around the progress, yeah, whether the pier that it was tied up to probably was in the plans. Um, but what's so interesting is the progress was off display. No one could get to it for months and months and months where it just sat uh, as the fair was literally built around it uh, before anyone was able to, to get on board and visit it. And of course, you know, very few actually did um, once, uh, once it did open. And we probably only have time for one more question, but I do want to point people to the final item that Jocelyn Nunes posted in the chat. It's a link where you can purchase Dan's book, and I definitely highly recommend it. Um, it will, and you will get a lot of good history in its pages. Mm -hmm. um, and so the last question, unless you answer it very quickly, um, is was the ship, uh, it's from Patricia Johnson, was the ship built with the knowledge that the whaling industry was dying? Mm. Uh, good question. No, it was actually, um, it actually went by another name. It was launched, I think, 1832. So it was an old ship by the time um, it, it goes to the fair, which is one of the reasons um, that they, they picked it is, you know, it, it was sort of, you know, in harbor, had uh, kind of lived out its life, uh, but uh, it had actually been launched um, a, as the Charles E. Phelps um, out of Rhode Island, um, then came into the New Bedford fleet, I forget which year, but was re renamed the Progress. Um, and the one reason they kept the name, and of course, you know, a, a couple of people have mentioned how ironic that name was, that Progress, you know, was anything but whaling. But one reason they kept the name um, is the people actually knew of the progress. They knew a little bit about whaling history or had heard a little bit about it. They knew of the progress because it was had a major role, a sort of a starring role in, in 1871 called the Arctic Disaster of 1871, which was when um, um, a huge amount of whaling ships were lost to Arctic ice and over a thousand uh, whalers, as well as some women and children that were part of or on board, all had to be rescued um, by by just a handful of of New Bedford ships that didn't get trapped in the ice. The Progress was one of those ships, was one of those rescue ships, and so it sort of has 
this this sort of backstory that you know people might have reading about this story, reading about this dramatic rescue. Um, and in fact, you know, that becomes part of its story once, uh, once it becomes a museum um, of sort of retelling uh, the story of 1871. And so they, they're, they're sort of a vested interest in, in keeping the name progress because it, it had uh, a little bit of name recognition, had a little bit of uh, historical recognition that, that people could, could connect. Thanks. Um, we actually have three minutes, so I'm going to sneak another question from Arthur Mata, who's actually my predecessor at the Whaling Museum. Um, Arthur says, apparently New Bedford sent whaling equipment to the 1876 Centennial Exposition. Some of it was re-exhibited at St. Louis in 1904. Can you expand on whether some of the progress exhibit implements returned here? Yeah, so um, a couple of interesting things about that. So, um, you know, Chicago is actually not the first um, major exposition um, in the United States, and it's not the first to have a whaling display, um, uh, but it is the only one that had a whaling, whaling ship, something on, on this scope. Uh, the thing that's so interesting about some of the earlier displays was that they were or on at the time as the National Museum. Uh, of course, today we call it the Smithsonian Institution. The Smithsonian actually uh, did a lot of uh, these early uh, whaling displays um, at these earlier fairs. In fact, I live now in Louisville. Um, the Southern Exposition, as well as the subsequent one in New Orleans, both had a sort of you know, pick up, pick down uh, whaling display that the Smithsonian put together uh, on behalf of New Bedford and, and incorporate a lot of New Bedford materials in that. Um, and so, you know, but what is interesting is by the time you get to Chicago, they sort of stepped away from that. They're actually more interested in the anthropological exhibits, the sort of the opening uh, for, for New Bedford to, to Brooklyn Museum. Um, as for the artifacts themselves, they, they actually have a really interesting history too. Um, they all ended up at the Field Museum in Chicago. Um, and uh, when the Field Museum opened, it opened with a display of whaling. It actually opened with a whaleboat uh, with mannequins and, you know, holding the harpoon and the whole nine yards. Um, the curators rebelled. Um, they hated it. They loved the, the natural stuff, and there's still parts of the, the Progress Collection, narwhal horns, uh, whale teeth, um, seashells. Um, that they kept, but anything actually connected to business of whaling, mechanics of whaling, um, were all carted off by train as soon as Chicago got rid of them to uh, what's now the Peabody uh, Essex Museum, uh, what was the, uh, the Peabody Museum in Salem. Um, so they actually ended up with the whaling imp implements. Um, so Chicago kept the natural history stuff, and Salem has the progress as whaling stuff. Uh, as far as I know, nothing actually made it back to New Bedford itself uh, from, from either of those. Thank you, Dan. Um, thank you for your presentation and for taking the time to have a conversation about your new book.